turn to number 389 uh, this afternoon. I am resolved number 389.
resolve to follow the Savior, faithful and true each day. Heed what he saith, do what he will, and he is the living way. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest highest. Resolve to enter the kingdom, leaving the cause of sin. Friends may oppose me, foes may beset me, so will I enter in. I will hasten to him, hasten to And who will go with me, come friends without delay. Talk by the Bible and by the Spirit, we'll walk the heavenly way. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, great is highest, I will Jim Thompson, could I have you open our time of prayer this afternoon? Would you mind? Our dear Heavenly Father, we are once again just so grateful that uh, we have been gathered here by mm. uh, your grace to hear from your powerful living word. Yes. And Father, we do pray that uh, you would open our hearts and minds to understanding that uh, you would give us indeed that boldness mm. that uh, you intend for us to have as your witnesses in this, this uh, ever-growing dark world. So we thank you, Father, for your words are truth, your words are life, are instruction, and infallible. We pray that you would be with your servant as he continues to teach us yes. uh, your word. We bless him with uh, strength and, uh, and wisdom uh, that comes from your word. And uh, we just find a, a good soil, uh, Lord, to, uh, to grow upon. And Father, may all things that we do and say here be honoring to you and glorifying yes. to your wonderful name. In Jesus' name, we give our thanks. Amen. Amen. Brother Cloud, would you come, please? Still no root beer under there. <laughs> okay. We want to continue these studies this afternoon on biblical holiness for the 21st century. This is the textbook, and we are actually doing the video classes together in this conference. And we have covered biblical uh, holiness, uh, what is holiness, in Sunday school, and then that there is no one key to holiness in the Bible. There are many things that come together for biblical holiness, and we looked at salvation at the New Testament church in the last session. And we want to deal now with position and practice with the book of Ephesians, the epistle of Ephesians, magnificent, infinite epistle, a heavenly book, amazing book. And we're going, we want to deal with position and practice. Position and practice. This is so fundamental to understand holiness. So fundamental. There's two aspects to the believer's holiness or sanctification. And it's essential that we understand this. And the better we understand this, the better we can deal with the aspect of holiness in our lives. There is position in Christ, your new position in Christ, that an unchanging position in Christ. When you come to Christ, you're born again. You are translated into the kingdom of Christ. And uh, you're, you're, you're converted. You're, you're changed from life to death and from, and all these, you're adopted. 
He's a child of God. All these magnificent things happen as God's gift, as a part of salvation. And they happen. And they happen just when you're saved. They happen right then. And you and you and you put in this whole new realm of existence as described in the Bible. And then there is the practical aspect of holiness in this present world. And uh, so the believer can say, I am sanctified in Christ. I am holy. And I am being sanctified in Christ. Both of those are true. And then ultimately we will be entirely sanctified. And sin will be gone and that it will be entirely liberation from all the present circumstances. If you don't understand this, you will be confused. Look at Romans 6, 6, and 7. I got an email the other day from a confused person. Romans 6, 6, and 7. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin, for he that is dead is free from sin. I'm free from sin. I'm crucified. The body of sin is dead. It's destroyed. Yeah, that's right. Positionally. If you don't understand that there's a difference here. Galatians 5.24 Galatians 5.24 do hope you brought your Bibles. And look up the verses quickly. Don't be a slow person. Life's too short to be slow. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. Have! Are you, are you Christ? Well, then you've crucified the flesh, effect, the flesh with the affections and lusts. Done deal. Yeah. Look at Colossians 2.11. Colossians 2.11. In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. You are. This is done. This is, this is talking about something that's accomplished. In putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. It's done. It's accomplished. Well then why, do, why is sin still there? Because there's these two aspects. And this is exactly what we see in, the, in Ephesians. It's so beautiful. That's, this is really the outline of Ephesians, the major outline of Ephesians. The first three chapters describe the believer's new position in Christ. It's amazing what the believer, the true born again believer, is in Christ. It's just amazing. And uh, that's the theme of the first three chapters, all first three chapters. Because until you understand what you are in Christ, what you have in Christ, then you can't start living for Christ properly. In, in chapters 4 through 6, we have the life in this present world. In chapters 1 through 3, the, the key words are in Christ. In Christ. In Christ. In Him. You're either in Christ or you're not. You're either saved or not. There's no in-between. In Biblically. So in God's eyes, if we look at Ephesians 1, the born-again believer is blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, Ephesians 1, 3. Blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Verse 4, holy and without blame before him in love, before God I am holy and without blame. Amazing. How's that? In Christ. In Christ. 
God doesn't see me. He sees Christ. I am in Him. God has put me in Him. Accepted in the Beloved, Ephesians 1 6, I am accepted. I am accepted by Almighty God, the Holy of Holies, the Holiest, the Holy, Holy, Holy God. Me, I'm accepted. What? Well, in the Beloved. I'm not the Beloved. Christ is the Beloved. If I'm in Him, I am accepted. Forgiven of sins, verse 7. Forgiven of sins. Not partially holy. It says forgiven of sins. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Sins forgiven. Verse 11. An eternal inheritance. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance. Have obtained. It's a done deal. It's accomplished. An inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his all will. An, an eternal inheritance which is described more in other passages. But, it, but I have it. It's a done deal. I have it. Sealed and dwelt by God's Spirit. Verses 13 and 14 in whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, after ye believed, that's how you received the gospel, the gift of salvation, ye were sealed, were sealed, that's past, it's done, sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is, which is the earnest of our inheritance, until the redemption of the purchased possession, all this is done. It's accomplished. I have it. It's a possession. It's a present possession. All these things, if you're saved, these are glorious things. These are things you should be very interested in studying about and learning about more and more. I'm, I'm interested in these things because they're my things. If you were to find out that you had some super rich uncle, and you are in his will, you would want to look at that will. You'd be interested. This is far more important than any old rich uncle. I don't care if he's Elon Musk or who he is in this present world. Man, this, these are eternal riches. They're mine. If I'm in Christ, these things are mine. I possess them. Not only that, look at chapter 2, verse 6 and 7. It's it's that we are already in heaven. Already in heaven. I'm already in heaven. That in the ages to come, verse 6, I'm sorry, chapter 2, verse 6, and, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We are now, hath, now, it's done. This is not talking about the bodily resurrection. This is, what I, this is my position in Christ. I'm in heaven with Him. That's what the Bible says. And of course you can't lose any of this because you didn't do anything to get any of this except believe. If you, add, if you try to add any works to this, those folks need to be here that have this confused. If you add any works to it, any tiny bit, then that's a work salvation. And that's a false gospel. And you can't be saved through a false gospel. This is all free. That Christ purchased all this. I'm in heaven. We. It says us. Sitting together in heavenly places. Sitting up there in heavenly places in Christ. Well, that's just some of the major things there. That, that new position. It's not based on any works. I can't add anything to the free gift of salvation. I can't add any, anything to it. Nothing needs to be added to it, and I can't add anything to it. And that, and that, and that fundamental passage here in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, 2, 8 through 10, that I was quoting to a man this afternoon, here it is. Here, here's, the, here's the gospel and the major aspects of the gospel in this beautiful three verses. We know it. Usually we know this uh, if we've been saved very long. For by grace are you saved through faith. 
And that, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. It is the gift of God. I like gifts. But if you pay anything for something, it's no longer a gift. Mm-hmm. If my wife, if I came to her and I said, well, I, you know, it's your birthday and I've got, I've got something for you. And uh, I, I saved up my money and I bought this. And, you, you know, you're excited when you give a gift. You want to give it. And, and she says, wow, that, that's expensive. I'll, can I make payments on that? But wait a minute, this is a gift. If you, if you pay 10 cents, it's no longer a gift. It's a gift. It's the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. If there was, if there was even a little work, we would be boasting. No, not of works. No works. Gift. Free gift. It's emphasized. Faith. Only my part. Faith. But then, well, what about works? Does it mean I don't have to work? God doesn't care how I live? Not at all. Doesn't mean that at all. But you've got to get these things straightened out. You've got to get the gospel verses 8 and 9. Without works, grace, free. Got to get that settled. And then verse 10 happens and flows out of that, that free salvation. For we are His workmanship. There it is, born again. Created in Christ Jesus. That's born again. If you haven't been created something new, you're not born again. You're not a New Testament Christian. You just have Christianity, religion. Doesn't change anything. There's no power to it. We are his workmanship by that free gift which God hath ordained that we should walk in them. God has a life to live, a holy life to live, as it's laid out in chapters 4 through 6. But you've got to get that, fr- that salvation part nailed down just right. And we don't understand. When we get saved, we don't understand what happens to us. That's when we start learning what actually happened to us. And there it is, all put together in that beautiful three little verses. Well, what about works? Yeah, works are, man, God really cares how we live. He really does. But you but it's got to flow out of biblical salvation as a free gift, so there's no glory in it. Everything I've, every good thing I've ever done in my Christian life in 51 years has added nothing, not anything to my salvation that I had that first night. Because Christ paid it all. And, and there's, a new, there's a new creation, and therefore it's His works. It's His works. Uh, the more you can understand that dynamic, the better, the better in your Christian life. And so chapters 1 through 3 is my position in Christ, what I have when I come to Christ and I'm born again. And it's just infinite treasures. But it's now. I have it now. I have it all now. I don't, you know, can't put my hands on all of it now. I'm a joint heir with Christ. What's that mean? It means a lot. The Son of God can speak worlds into existence. I'm a joint heir with Him. Whatever He has, I have. That's big stuff. We don't begin to comprehend how big that is, but it's big. And I have it now. It's mine. Yeah, but I'm still living in this world. That's the problem. And there still is sin. God has ordained that he not take away the sin nature when he gets saved. And I can understand uh, some fundamental reasons for that. Primarily, it's because this Christian life is to be a life of faith. And so there must be temptations. There must be. There must be trials. There must be. Or you don't live by faith. And so God leaves that there. We have to deal with it. We have to deal with it by His Spirit. And that is the subject of chapter 4 through 6 of Ephesians. The believers walk in this world. And that is, that is the key word. That is the key word in chapter 4. Walk. Ephesians 4, 1 starts right out with that theme. I therefore the prisoner of the Lord 
beseech you that you walk, walk your life worthy of the vocation wherewith you're called. So you've been called, what's that? Chapter 1 through 3, all of that. That's my calling in Christ. And therefore I am to walk worthy of that. Not real complicated. Live that life out, which is summarized there in Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. Live that new creation life out in, in, in the works that he has ordained. Because of what I am in Christ, therefore, live like it. Verse 17, chapter 4, verse 17. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk, not as other Gentiles walk. No, there's to be a whole complete difference now. In the vanity of their mind. That's how they live. That's how they live. The vanity of their mind is lived out in their life. Don't, walk, don't live like that anymore. Don't think like that anymore. That's over. That's the old life. Chapter 5, verse 2. Ephesians 5, verse 2. And walk in love. Walk your life. In, as Christ also hath also loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. And so the walk. Ephesians 5 verse 8. For ye were sometimes darkness. Yes, you were. That's the before salvation. Darkness. You were darkness. But now, now, not maybe, but now for sure, your light in the Lord. Okay, that's Ephesians 1, 2, 3. Walk as children of light. You are this, therefore live like that. Well, if, see, there's position in practice. If it's all position and it's all new and there's no more sin anymore, then I, I don't have to be instructed to do anything. But I am. And I can disobey it or not. And that's the practice. The key word is to walk. Greek word, peripateo. To tread all around, figuratively, to live, to be occupied with that word. Your daily life, your practical life. According to Ephesians, major elements of the practical sanctification in Ephesians 4 through 6 are a right relationship with the New Testament church. Where do you see that? Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. One of the fundamental passages on the New Testament church is that God has these major passages in which he summarizes major doctrines and uh, in a few verses. And, one, and we looked at uh, Acts 2 this morning. That's a major passage on the New Testament church. But another major passage on the New Testament church is Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. Uh, depicted as a body. A body. With the leaders, it starts with the leaders in verses 11 and 12. And, uh, and, and their part in building up all the members to be what God wants them to be, to be functioning, the whole body together functioning, building itself up, edifying one another, protecting themselves from false teachers, Verse 14, the winds of doctrine and, and growing unto perfection, which also involves our outreach to lost people, but it's described as a body. It's not just a big head with a bunch of little feet. I think that's Jack Howe's model. <coughs> I think that's funny, but anyway. That's <laughs> a body. Every member having a port apart, being put there by Christ, a living stone in that spiritual house. Uh, stones, you build houses with stones and the builder puts them where he wants to and shapes them and all. That's God he does that. Puts them in the body as he 
pleases and then they are there to folks in that that's a beautiful passage major elements of practical holiness uh, again we come back to the new testament church right here in the heart of ephesians 4 through 6 which is a major passage on holy living ephesians 4 17 through 31 putting on the new man putting on that new man well if i have it already why do i have to put it on well there's two aspects position and practice Biblical separation, Ephesians 5, 3 through 14. Very essential part of holiness is separation from evil. That's not a minor subject. That's major, major emphasis in the New Testament. Separation from evil. And uh, it's not a minor thing. You can't have a New Testament church if you don't have separation from evil. From the world and from evil. You can't have a New Testament church. And that means that a whole bunch of fundamental Baptists are going away from a New Testament pattern quickly. They don't publicly without separation, usually, they just leave it alone. And then living out faith, the living circumspectly, Ephesians 5 15 through 17. That circumspect walk, that constant watching. That, that building yourself up in the Word of God and then using that to be guarding yourself from dangers. Understanding that this is an hour of apostasy as never been before. And there's dangers on every hand and there's dangers on the internet. Not just moral dangers, doctrinal dangers. And that circumspect walk that I, I've got to be watching. I can't just be going through life. In the home. Well, circumspectly. Ephesians 5, 22 through 6, 4. Major aspects of practical sanctification. Living out the faith of Christ in the Christian home. Living out the faith of Christ in the Christian home. Major, major thing. And that is written to a church. Ephesians was a church. And that was to be taken by the church and to build up the families. And then the families build the church. It's beautiful. But it's a major part of sanctification, holiness, these things. We're just looking at what Paul emphasized. Learning from that. That's all we're doing. And this, this is a major passage on practical sanctification. Well, what things did he hammer on? Okay. He hammered on godly servant-master relationships, Ephesians 6, 5 through 9. Servant-master relationship. You say, well, I don't have any masters. Well, you do. And uh, usually you work for somebody. Some people are their own bosses. But, but usually in this world we have masters. And... Uh, and, and, and we have people working under us all kinds of dynamics there those relationships are very important to God because he deals with them both sides of that the, servant, the worker, the servant in whatever sense you're under a servitude kind of thing I know you're Americans and Canadians we, we are free people yeah but there, there's God's, God treats that very seriously <coughs> And, uh, and we must too. That's a part of practical holiness. And then, and there's a lot to it, all of these things. And then he emphasizes victorious uh, spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare. Major passage, Ephesians 6, 10 through 20. And we're in a spiritual war. We've got to understand and put on the spiritual armor and, and learn how to deal with it. It's, it's a major part of holiness. You have to learn these things. You have to learn them better and better. This is holiness. This is holiness. Practical. It's very nice. And it's not complicated. God's truth is not... It's, it's, it's stated in such a way that ordinary people can understand it. And if you find a doctrine that's real complicated, it didn't come from God. Oh yeah, there's, there's infinite 
understanding in the Bible. I'm not saying, you know, but, but I'm talking about the, the basic nature of Bible doctrine is a basic simplicity that ordinary people can understand. And, uh, and you can even take to a poor part of the world where there's a lot of illiterate people and they can understand it when they get saved. There's that simplicity to Bible truth. And uh, the devil likes to make things very complicated. Calvinism is very complicated, by the way. Uh, it, invariably, I've found dealing with Calvinism and dealing uh, that, that when you say you're against it, they will say you don't understand it. Well, I've studied and studied and studied it. If it's that complicated, then it, I don't know what to do. I don't have any more intelligence than I have, and I have some basic intelligence. Then it, it's got to be something wrong here. No, God doesn't make it like that. Doesn't make it like that. And so, this is holiness. There is a position. You've got to make sure you're saved. Because none of that belongs to you until you're born again. Born again is a good word. I, I've gone to ecumenical conferences to, to learn with press credentials for research. The first one I went to was in 1987 in New Orleans. And uh, I was there with Dennis Costello. He was with Fundamental Evangelistic Association. And he took me to that and uh, helped me learn the ropes with some of that kind of research. And it was just massive. There were 30,000, 35,000 people there, 40 denominations, Roman, everybody, Roman Catholics, Lutherans, Methodists, Presbyterians, Baptists, you name it. We were all there, Pentecostals, Charismatic. And, uh, had a Catholic Mass every morning, and uh, just endless heresies, confusion, Christian rock, of course, right in the center of that unity. Nothing's more effectual in ecumenical unity today than contemporary Christian music. That's right. Just for that reason alone, I won't have anything to do with it. That's the one world church, folks. Yeah. I don't want anything to do with that. Nothing, get out of here with that stuff. Well, I was there in the middle of the One Lord Church stuff. Roman Catholic priests were speakers. The last speaker was a Catholic priest, Tom Forrest, from Rome. He was there with, working with John Paul II at the time. And he was the final speaker. And he brought everybody to their, he put that crowd into a ecumenical frenzy. He said, we've got to, he said, we're angels of light. Wait a minute. Do you know what you're talking about? That's false teachers. Demons and stuff in 2 Corinthians 11. Of course, he didn't know the Bible. Angels of light. Neither did anybody else. They said, Woo, yeah, we're angels of light. And then he said, we've got to reach the world. The subject was evangelism. We've got to reach the world and we've got to do it. The only way we can do it, we've got to do it together. They Blast it off. Ecumenical frenzy. And I said, whoa, this is a nutty crowd here. <laughs> and holiness, circumspect, living out all these things, learning better and better. Yeah, one, one afternoon, a uh, fellow exhorted me and because uh, I wasn't with the program imagine being in the midst of all that and uh, I, I said to him how can you be comfortable in the midst of all this false doctrine and stuff he said you need to relax and enjoy what God is doing yeah I want to enjoy what God's doing but I don't want to enjoy what the devil's doing. Blindly walking along. No, got to get this. And I would talk to people about salvation at those conferences. And, and there would be the workers, you know, the ministry people there representing all kinds of ministries. And I'd go around and, and ask him. And one, one question I would ask him is, are you born again? And one Catholic said, is, that's not a Catholic term, is it? <laughs> no. 
Maybe not. But actually, they do teach that. It's through baptism. And uh, get all kinds of answers, you know, charismatic experiences they had. They were born again. Some just had no answer at all. You've got to be born again. Jesus said you must be born again. And born again is not just something we make up. It is got to be defined exactly according to Scripture. Exactly according to Scripture. Born again. It's the most important thing in the world. In all of life. Must nail that down and then help other people. Help other people. When you're born again, you have all that that is described in Ephesians 1 through 3. All those beautiful things are yours. As a free gift that Christ paid for by His blood, what a price. He paid. He paid the whole thing. And there's a great attack upon the vicarious substitutionary atonement of Christ. And Oh, it's nasty. And they say a God that would require His Son uh, to, be cru- to, to suffer is a mean God. Oh, you wicked thing. No, he's a loving, compassionate God. He is a holy God that has a holy law. And when you break his holy law, there must be punishment. And, he fig- and his great plan was that, yes, I can have the authority of the law stand. And also I can forgive sinners because I'm going to pay the price that my own law requires that God shed his blood. Acts chapter 20. God shed his blood. Yeah. That was the price. And, and, and for our riches. For our riches. And then, there, and then out of that born again. New creation. Flows. The holy life. And it's not any instantaneous thing. It's growing. Position. And practice. Yeah. It's one of the first things we teach our people. In the discipleship course that we have, uh, one year discipleship course, everyone that gets saved in our work is assigned a member of our church, qualified member, to go through the discipleship course with that individual or with their family, week by week, as long as it takes. And uh, we've seen great good things out of that. It builds relationships. People can answer questions and grow in their knowledge. And one of the first things we deal with is position and practice. You've got to come to the understanding of that. And you understand things, first of all, on a baby level. And you think, boy, I've got that. No, you really don't. But you do on a baby level. Now let's just keep growing in the understanding of these things. And that is biblical holiness. Pastor? Amen. Thank you, Brother Clow. And that's one thing that we really need to get settled and understood is the practical and the, um, uh, oh my goodness, <laughs> the positional and the practical. It's so important that we understand the difference and how the scripture uh, presents that to us. Um, I, we've got a couple of minutes, so I'm going to share my testimony. And many of you know my testimony, but as you were speaking, Brother Cloud, I thought this came to my mind back 57 years ago. I was taken out of the Johnson's home and I was put into the Bodeway home. But I still was living like a Johnson. And my parents said, Tracy, (laughs) that was my name then, you are now a Bodeway. Positionally, you are a Bodeway. You need to now live like a Bodeway. And I've often think of that, and that still rings in my heart and mind, my parents telling me, you know, that's what you were. Now you are. And now that you are, then live that way. And that's what God says. I've taken you out of the kingdom of darkness. I've translated you into the kingdom of my dear son. Now live like that. And that's what, that's what practical. Uh, and of course, there's the growth, the growing. You know, and that's what I'm so thankful, brother, that God is patient. I'm so thankful that he's patient. He's been patient with me as I've grown and we need to be patient with one another. Sometimes we always think, you know, well, you should, no, let's be patient, let up, but, but grow in the Lord. Grow in the things of the Lord. 
Uh, God is good. Amen. God is good. And so we positionally are in Christ. If you're saved this afternoon, if you're not saved, you need to come to Christ. You need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And then if you are saved, you need to recognize positionally that's where you are now practically live it. Walk in. Walk, walk, walk. That's a beautiful passage of scripture. If you ever take time to go through chapter 4 and chapter 5, the number, I think five times. I, I think it's five. It could even be more than that. Walk 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 god commands us how he would have us to walk amen and so what a wonderful passage and thank you for reminding us of that wonderful truth all right we're going to take a break again we'll take about 15 minutes maybe uh, just a couple more minutes than that and at uh, four o'clock we'll come back in and start again and, and finish our last session for today all right